I was born to Lebanese Shia parents, um, and I was raised in a strict, tight-knit, conservative Shia community. You know, high levels of adherence, high high levels of of uh, conformity to the actual jurisprudence, and so the stuff that dictates what you wear and how you worship, and everything I did was supposed to be keeping the family's honor in mind and, and just the, the family image. So it meant that I was just very limited in terms of, of, of all the stuff that I could do. I basically went to school and came home. I had very few friends and they had to be approved by my family. But almost everything that we did as a family was gender segregated. Like if we ever went to the mosque, the genders were in different rooms. Even at like social events, there would be like a women's section and a men's section. Even if we had people over at our house, you know, the women would sit on one side of the room, the men would sit on the other side of the room. Um, so it was just that, that type of upbringing where everything, almost everything was, was designed around maintaining sexual purity. Um, and I was raised basically based on the idea that I was going to be, you know, my father's daughter until I became my husband's wife. Every single moment felt like trauma. It felt like I was being watched and controlled and manipulated all the time and I couldn't do it anymore. So one day I just kind of like packed up some of my things and I left. And uh, you know, as soon as my family realized I was gone, they alerted Hezbollah. Uh, you know, being Shia, being from Lebanon, it basically means that um, you are from the demographic that Hezbollah feels themselves to be authorities over and like, that they're like the arbitrators of everything that goes on in there. By the time I left Lebanon, I was I was 23, which means I was getting to be an old maid, and I hadn't had any suitors yet. So I started talking about going to grad school in the states, and eventually they they kind of were on board with the idea. And you know they they placed so many conditions on it. I just wanted to get to the point where I was like on American soil, because then I could do whatever, and I didn't want them to suspect anything, so I just said yes to no matter how ridiculous their conditions were. Um, and one of their conditions was my father would go with me to, you know, set me up, get me into my apartment, set up my bank account, set up everything so that he had access to everything. Um, and I said yes to that, and he came over with me to the States, and it was just like, I like by a day, I, it was just like, because he found out like a couple of days after we got to the U.S. Like he got suspicious and he started looking through my computer. He installed this like surveillance software that um, records your keystrokes. And, uh, but it was kind of too late because we were already in the U.S. And my father can't do the things here that he can do back home. So eventually he just kind of like went back to Lebanon and I did my own thing. I come from a community where hijab is, is mandatory um, and it's a type of hijab that is not just, you know, it's not reducible to a mode of clothing or like, you know, wearing some cloth around your head. It's, it's rooted in a modesty doctrine. It's rooted in a doctrine that um, privileges sexual purity almost over everything else. So for me, the hijab was, um, you know, it was that I had to dress a certain way, I had to wear clothing that covered everything except for the hands and the face, and it was so uh, strict that like, even like if a bit of your wrist shows, or this, this little underside of your chin shows, that would be considered haram, that that's not proper hijab. There is so much focus and credence given to the voices of women who are frankly a very, very privileged minority to be able to voice their conviction and, and their um, uh, affinity to the hijab. And what and, and that I think that that maybe makes people think that like oh we were wrong about this thing and it's not like an oppressive tool of the patriarchy it's a thing that women actually like and want the problem with that is anyone who has to wear hijab and doesn't like doing it you're not going to be hearing from them you're not going to be you're you're going to be hearing from the people who actually conform to their dominant cultural zeitgeist you're going to be hearing from the women who are celebrated and uplifted when they speak about this because it's the way that their communities like and endorse the hijab spoken about. When I wore hijab and I didn't want to wear it, if someone had asked me if I liked hijab and if I thought it was wonderful, I would have said, oh yeah, go hijab, because I didn't have the choice. It's just, it's just this, this false dichotomy, the idea that, you know, if you have 
if you only have one effective choice and if you cleave to that choice you walk around and you say it's my free choice i would have chosen that anyway it still doesn't speak to what would happen if you would have chosen otherwise 